Today is Tuesday, September 27, 2016. This is the regular meeting of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Good morning. Let the record reflect Commissioner Johnson, Sobroff, Figueroa Villa, and McLean Hill are present, and we have a quorum. Number one on the agenda, consent agenda items. We have a card for 1A. 1A? Yes, sir. Okay, and do we have, uh, do, do any of my fellow commissioners want any of the consent item agendas uh, pulled? Items pulled? No? Okay, can I, do I have a motion to approve items 1, B, C, D, E? Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Okay, bring the comment up for item 1A, please. For 1A, we have Beth Kemp. And this is relative to a donation in the amount of $125. Yeah, this is a general comment and a opposing comment because week after week we come here and we notice that despite the fact that LAPD eats up over 50% of the city budget, they ask for donations and receive donations on a regular on a regular basis. So if they're going to be receiving donations, maybe the monies of those donations need to start being deducted from what they receive from the city because Frankly, I'm sick and tired of paying for criminalization, and I'm sick and tired of people getting rewarded for killing people and continuing to get monies from community groups who act as if you guys are a poverty case. It's a joke. It's a fucking joke. The money needs to go to community members. Money doesn't need to be going to the police. Donations don't need to be going to the police. You're not a nonprofit. You're not like doing something special. You're not like raising money for charity. You're raising money for yourselves and your own selfish needs. And there are no other comment cards on this item? Do I have a motion to approve uh, item 1A? Do I have a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay. And before we move on to item number two, Commissioner. Like to, I'd like to say something. Last, last Tuesday, I lost my temper. <laughs> we have order, please. We have order, please. <laughs> Can we have order, please? And I want to apologize. What? You want to apologize? <coughs> please, no, no disrupting the commissioner to making a statement. A number of people. First, first of all, um, to Commissioner McLean Hill. Um, second of all, to the other commissioners. Um, third of all, to the police officers that were in this room, because I think, I think that um, my uh, losing my temper, which um, I did, I think uh, escalated things that um, that put you guys in a difficult position, and I apologize for that. And last but not least, I want to apologize to everyone that's here. And okay, can we can we let can we and let to the public finish, please? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Sir, if you continue to interrupt, I'm going to ask you to leave. Um, I mean, can I say something, please? Um, first, I uh, want to thank Commissioner Sobroff for doing what is difficult, and that is saying in public that um, that he made a mistake in losing his temper. Um, and I want to also say that I have a tremendous amount of respect for every single participant in these meetings, members of the public, certainly members of the department and the commissioners on the dais. Uh, it's difficult to sit in silence while people express with great passion their point of views. Not nearly as difficult, I will acknowledge, as some of the things that people come here to tell us about and some of the things that are endured by citizens all across the nation, so not nearly as difficult. 
I can tell you for me, and certainly for the commissioners whom I've gotten to know incredibly well over the last <laughs> month, that there is a tremendous interest in and commitment to providing the kind of oversight that both supports and also, frankly, seeks to improve policing in the city of Los Angeles. We're committed to both. That process is furthered by your presence and your participation, but I have to say it is not furthered by any of us when we give in to the frustration that we all feel in a way that disrupts, trivializes, or demeans other people. And it's my sincere hope that we can see less of that as we move forward. Um, again, I thank Commissioner Sobroff and would ask others to take note. Apologies aren't easy. And just grace <laughs> demands that when they're sincerely given that we try to accept them. Thank you both for your, for your statements this morning. Thank you. We're now on item number two, report of the Chief of Police, Chief Beck. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. So this past week was the uh, 11th straight week of uh, crime reduction in the city. At the beginning of the summer, we were at 16.3% increase in, in overall violent crime. And uh, as we sit today, we're at 11.8% increase. So we, we made steady progress uh, in each of those 11 weeks. Still have a ways to go, but, uh, but we're making steady progress. Homicides are down in the city, about 1.4% uh, as compared to last year. Rapes are down 5.7%. Uh, Robberies are up 12.8. Aggravated assaults are up 13.8. Burglaries are up, uh, excuse me, burglaries are down 5.3%. Motor vehicle thefts are up 15.4%. Burglary theft from vehicles not, are up 9.6%. And general thefts are down 1.9%. So that gives us a, a total violent crime picture of a positive 11.8% compared to last year. Property crime 3.9% increase compared to last year. And when you aggregate them to give you total part one crime, it's a 5.6% increase over last year. A uh, number of victims shot are, are down in the city of Los Angeles, 2.9%. Uh, That's a total of 25 fewer victims shot this year than last year. Uh, each of our bureaus shows an incremental increase with uh, uh, West Bureau having the smallest increase of 3.7% <laughs> and Valley Bureau having the largest increase of 7.1%. That's in part one crime. Uh, use of uh, force incidents, categorical use of force incidents are uh, down 10.6% from our four-year average. And officer-involved shootings are down about 5% from our four-year average. Uh, gang crime uh, is up in total 5.1% in the city. And um, the standout in that area is uh, gang-related homicide reduction of 8.7%. Gang-related homicides typically make up about 60% of our total homicide picture in the city. Traffic collisions are up 8.5% in total. Uh, the uh, DUI-related or driving under the influence-related are down 4.5%. Hit and runs are up 5.1. Motor vehicle versus pedestrians are down 4.4. And bicycle involved are down 18.3. Our personnel statistics are we have 9,844 sworn personnel on payroll. We have 2,736 civilian personnel, just over 400 reserves, uh, 284 specialist volunteers, 57 chaplains, and 7,861 young people in our cadet program. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for the chief? 
Um, <coughs> yes, I asked uh, Chief uh, two weeks ago, um, and uh, I will just renew my request, and perhaps um, I did not uh, state it in a way that it would actually move forward, but I did ask if you would report back to the commission and frankly ask that it be <coughs> agendized in a manner that would allow it to occur as to when we might expect um, some um, decision from your office in connection with these ill forward. <coughs> I'd like to renew that request and to um, ask that you report back in two weeks. Um, in addition, I did ask and would like to renew my request with respect to um, when you might um, be in a position to publicly uh, reveal the names of the officers that were involved in the shooting in Watts a few months back. Um, again, I'm not clear that either of these matters can be discussed in public. Um, that will need to be determined by the city attorney, but I um, will ask on a pretty regular basis until I get a response. Thank you. Yeah, we, do, we do have nine common cards in this item. You know, if I, I'll, I'll respond to that. So okay. uh, I believe that, that all the names uh, have been released. We'll check with FID on that, but I believe that they've been released. And as the, uh, for the, on the Ford matter, uh, as this relates to discipline, uh, we cannot discuss it as to the nature, uh, but I can talk to you about timing, but I think that should be done uh, in private to make sure that, uh, that we respect uh, personnel rights. But we can check with the city attorney about that. Thank you. Okay, we have nine common cards. The first four, Prentice Jenkins, Paula Minor, Kai Utsumi and Jojo Smith. Prentice Jenkins. Good morning. Good morning. Published the City Life newsletter, activist since 1991. Good morning, President Johnson, Vice President Soberoff, Board, Chief. Uh, I want to thank you for coming back with that <coughs> decision on the Zell Ford shooting. The officer was out of policy. My job is to build bridges between the community and the police. I've decided to take on that task. And the only way we can do that is to be very open and honest with one another. We've uh, been here for a long time talking about his L4, and that was a, uh, that was a shock, and I was also uh, happy about what I heard. Uh, the justice system will take it from there. Uh, we had some incidents this week of other African Americans being shot and killed. I wish I had a, uh, a satellite office there. We probably could have stopped that <laughs> in bridging gaps between the police and the fire and the police and the uh, community. Uh, it's like the, I, I look at it like the Golden Gate Bridge. Golden Gate Bridge was difficult to build. It took four years and 11 people died trying to build that bridge. So it's not going to be an easy task, folks. But trust me, I'm up for the task. That's the sort of thing I do. And when we decide to get the finances together, I told you, I'll do the work. I'll do the heavy list lifting. But you got to get the finances together. Someone says, I want to help build the bridge. You got to do your part. I'm going to do my part. Everyone else has to do their part. That means the finances. Get it together. And trust me, we can stop these shootings. These shootings can be stopped, but it's not going to be easy. But if we, we work together, it will be simple. Thank you. Thank you. Paula Miner. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I also would like to say thank you to uh, Commissioner McLean Hill for bringing up the Zell Ford case. Um, as we know, that occurred in 2014. And I would like to ask that as you get information, that information be shared within the limits of the personnel practices with Ezel Ford's mother, Tritobia. So um, I would like to, if you would add that to your request. Um, I want to comment on, on the statistics that 
Chief Beck reports weekly. Um, when he talks about the redu reduction in various crimes, it's always this year compared to last year. However, when he talks about the officer-involved shootings, he talks about a four-year average instead of comparing this year to last year. And so I'm really concerned. I understand that one of the roles of LAPD is to present information and statistics so that we can't really understand it, but it looks good. We think it's good. It is not good. Officer-involved shootings needs to have the same kind of statistical measure as everything else. I'd also like to mention, too, that LAPD led um, some kind of activity honoring victims of homicide in South Los Angeles. However, the victims listed, the victims honored, did not include those who were killed in officer-involved shootings. So I think that we need to think about how those things look to the community, how those things are separated and handled in what we call the propaganda to tell us one thing when it means something else. And I appreciate the fact that Commissioner McLean Hill maybe is kind of lifting that rock up so that people can see what's under it. Um, the other thing is, um, Chief Beck, we heard you on the radio talking about making excuses for the murder of Ms. Guzman. And I think, again, to be concerned about community trust, what you say, no matter where you are, needs to be consistent. Thank you for your comment. Kai Utsumi. Um, just, uh, just one note. I, I, in the chief's defense, on the officer-involved shootings, he gave the comparison to the five-year average and said we were down 5%. In fact, if he was trying to make the statistics look good, he would have compared it to last year, and we are down 30% from last year. So he, that was not an effort to try, that was not an effort to try and make, think. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I mean, it, you, you, if, you want, if you want the comparisons to last year, we can do that, it's, it's, it's down 30%. Next speaker, please. Kai Utsumi, please. Thank I'm you. a human rights activist with Los Angeles Community Action Network for the homeless and other human rights issues. LAPD drains the city's budget by taking over 50% of the city's budget. You know, and there's a lot of other needs that the city goes without because the L.A. city drains the budget. They don't need more police. Uh, one of the things that the, the uh, Mayor Garcetti over a year ago has said, we have a state of emergency. Now, Mayor Garcetti is the one that's picked Chief Bick and pick the members of the commission. He says over a year ago, we have a emergent state of emergency, and he's talking about not having enough housing for the homeless. Well, he has he has not made up, uh, has not made good on that state of emergency. It looks like it was all a bunch of rhetoric. Uh, they need to cut the personnel uh, of the uh, police, and, and they need to train the whole police department into a new humane force that does not depend on guns, tasers, clubs, and a whole arsenal of military weapons, including drones, tear gas, water cannons, assault weapon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> All these kill, unnecessary killing of unarmed black and brown youth, unnecessary killing. I call that murder, murder. And <laughs> this commission allows it Th to go Thank on. you for your they comments, sir. They don't even make a recommendation, a public statement. Maybe they don't have the power to get rid of Chief Beck, who does nothing about sir, it. Thank, thank you but for your maybe comments. Maybe they could go and make a public statement. You have a First Amendment Bill of Rights, freedom of speech. 
Sir, thank you for All your right. comments. So, as uh, if you if police, you have additional comments uh, to make, as police, sir, if you have additional comments to make, please submit them. another card for Just, public comment. You already have too much police and power. The next speaker, Jojo Smith, please. Jojo Smith, Los Angeles Community Action Network. You know, Sister McLean, this this force is never going to stop killing people unless we put them on charges. Chief Beck, you need to resign because you're just allowing your officers to go out and kill. If you put charges on them, they would think about killing people. Like, this is a warfare. Y'all are killing us and you're letting them get, you're, you're letting your men get away with it. If I went out and killed somebody, I would never see a daylight. But these officers go out and kill people. Oh, let's do an eight-hour uh, class and put them right back on the streets. I'm sorry. If I kill somebody, I'm getting life. I'll never see daylight on the streets again. Why is it? These are, they're not above the law. These pigs are not above the law. So you need to resign. You're a piece of shit, Beck. The next three speakers, we have Lisa Simpson, Beth Kemp, and David Sanchez. Good morning. Good morning. I am Richard Risher. I am Richard Risher. Chief Beck, your statistics, save it for somebody that really believe it. Your officers that you got here, you should add them in your statistic as part of the gangs because they're gangbangers in uniforms. They killing kids. You don't even care. You have no compassion. You send your officers out here and they be on the scenes while they killing people, kids, and guess what your officers do? Stand down. They hear an officer down, guess what your officers do? Stand down. Guess why? Because they know they other officers is killing somebody kid, like they killed my kid. And you didn't do nothing about it. You just went to other states running your mouth. Run your mouth to me. I will respect you more. You ain't told me you were so sorry. You didn't apologize. None of your officers apologized. You know who killed my son. You know who killed him. You send your officers to the Nickerson Gardens to play pity pat, right? Oh, go over there and harass these people. Offer them money. Is the money coming from the money that you guys are receiving? Because you're offering people money to shut up about a murder of an 18-year-old kid. How you feel about that? You don't have no feelings. You know why? <laughs> when have the devil ever had feelings? I'm looking at you dead in your face, Satan. <laughs> you don't know what God said, vengeance is mine? <laughs> vengeance is mine on you. You can blink and all that, but you got to answer to me, sweetie. You got to talk to me. You ain't a man, you a mouse. You need some cheese? You walk around, you act like you this, you that. You start a lot of shit, and then you leave the board meeting and leave your fellow comrades here to take on your bullshit. You feel me? You ain't a man of your word. You ain't even a man. You just a, a person with a whole bunch of words. I don't want you to retire. I want you to go to jail because you the one put these cops up to killing these kids out here. And you're not stopping it because you don't care. It ain't your kid. It's not your kid. Your kids and your grandkids is at home. You see them all the time. You get to talk to them every day. Guess what, Chief Beck? I never get to talk to my son again. I will never get to say hello or good morning to my son again. Guess why? Because of you? Because of you and your cops. What you gonna do about it? What you gonna do about it? I'm challenging you to do something about your crooked cops, along with yourself. You don't need no pension, you don't need nothing. They need to put you in the prison system and let them guys have their way with you. Because you a faggot to me. Yeah, that part. I don't like you. We'll never be cool. Ain't nothing you can tell me. All I want is one, I just want one answer. I want you to answer one question for me. Why? Ms. Why? Thank you. Thank you for your comments this morning. Why? You can't answer that, huh? Because you ain't a man. That's why you can't answer it. That's why you're looking at me like that, because you can't answer it. You can't answer shit. 
All you can do is sit there and look stupid, and then when you get tired of hearing the people's voice, you get up off that panel and walk your bitch ass up out of here. Next speaker, please. Yeah, I'm looking at you dead in your face because I'm not scared of you. Send your officers to me. I'm ready to die so I can see my son again. Ma'am, we we really need to move on to the next speaker. That part. Yeah. Yeah, blink your eyes because I'm blinking mine too. Ma'am. But be a man and talk to me though, Chief Beck. When you going to call me? My number is 909-347-3953. When you going to call me? Because I've been waiting for two months for my call. He's not going to respond. Yeah, not, I'm upset too. He's not going to respond. I know he's not. I know he's not. He's just going to look like a stupid person because he's he, stupid. He, he can't respond. And, and stop taking up for him, Ms. McClain, because he killed my son. And ain't nothing that you can say to make bring that back to me. Can't none of y'all give me my son back. So stop taking up for this bitch-ass nigga. The next speaker, Beth Kemp. I am really like disgusted by this. You listen to these statistics, as Paula had said, you know, and to me, it sounds like a bunch of garbage. Why? Because specifically the gang on uh, gang related crime you talk about when like half the city is under gang injunctions, then it's always gang related crime. Lisa's son was accused of being a gang member, despite the fact he wasn't even from Nickerson Gardens. He wasn't even from the area, yet your officers and your, uh, your, your uh, police officers who speak to the media, they said he was a gang member. That's bullshit. That is absolute bullshit. You're criminalizing people. You're criminalizing children, babies, teenagers by who they're related to, who their neighbors are. You know what? I lived, I'm, I'm, fr- I'm not from here, and I'm from an area where there are gangs. And since I've lived here, I've seen very little as far as gang violence in comparison to where I'm from and in comparison to where other people I know are from and where I have visited, like cities like Baltimore. And we still are blaming the community for what is happening. Well, we should be blaming the city. We should be blaming the police for criminalizing people, for making people to the point where they have nothing else and they're fighting each other. And this is bullshit. You know, I think that we really need a change, and we need a change in this department. Starting with Chief Beck, you should resign immediately. And the rest of you, anyone who has killed anyone, as I stated a few weeks ago, Section 137 of the State Penal Code says that they are to be removed from their position and a $4,000 fine, which was their entire pay at the time it was written. So we do have a civil code in this state to protect the people not criminalize them like the penal code does. So it's up to you and it's up to the city attorney and the county attorney, the DAs, to file charges against these prayer police, hold them accountable, and stop letting them get away with murder. David Sanchez, please. Can we have order, please? Order, please. Okay, let's call the next speaker, please. The next speaker, David Sanchez. Followed by Agustin Cebada. Hello, everyone. I'm here to protest the uh, the murder of Norma Angie Guzman, 34 years old, and also uh, to protest uh, the murder of uh, Jesse Romero, uh, 14, uh, who was also killed by the LAPD. I'm also here to ask for fairness on part of everyone here. Let's, let's be fair. Um, the, the policemen who are here, I'm asking you to be fair. I'm asking the commission to be fair. And I'm asking the press to be fair because the, the press is under a FCC ruling and they're supposed to give these matters uh, or the public a fair share of the airwaves and the media has not given us a fair share of the airwaves, especially the Mexican-American community. You never hear about us and we're the largest community in Los Angeles County, and we're constantly ignored, and our grievances are constantly ignored, and that's why I'm here to bring forward these grievances and to state that the lawsuits, when you kill someone, there's lawsuits. Those lawsuits are a waste of taxpayers' money. And they continue to pay the money and, and continue to be corrupt because we have a corrupt city, we have a corrupt mayor, we have a corrupt city council who continues to allow the murdering of people in our community uh, by 
of police who do not know what they're doing, who do not have methods. We need to find other methods uh, to deal uh, with situations. Uh, people are tired across the country. They're tired of being treated like slaves. And it's time that we find methods to stop uh, <laughs> killing people. Uh, one of the methods uh, that I brought up before was uh, to uh, for the police to have a warning shot before they did that many years ago they did the warning shot uh, to let people know and I suggest that the first bullet in every gun should be a blank bullet uh, for a warning shot and also in case there's an accident I think you should discuss this uh, these methods uh, during your meetings uh, it's time to stop police violence and stop uh, stop killing uh, people in our community thank you Thank you for your comments. Agustin Cevada from the Chicano Roundtable. And I'm here to talk about the crass outlook that a lot of your officers have. And I think that goes up to you, Mr. Beck, that uh, they feel that the, the, this is a quote that came out in the LA Times. I would have shot the suspect to 10 feet away and would have had no issue. <coughs> he said, I would not, I would have gone to bed with no issues at all. Okay, in other words, what does that say about that person who represents the, the union? It says that it's tolerated for, for Chief Beck and some of the rest of you, it's Mr. Ro so Soboroff, the dinosaur on this, on this commission. And, you know, you have no, no way of dealing with that. That shows you the crass outlook that you have, kill them doesn't make a goddamn difference because we'll put that person on, on, a, on a desk and paying his, his salary, or, you know. And in this case of, of uh, Nora, Nora uh, Guzman, it's a very bad case that you did over there in, in San Pedro, right? not far from here. And... Uh, the two officers that did it were a, a probation officer and a trainee, and it's, it's here. It's, it's uh, Officer Samuel Briggs and An Antonio McNeely or something, Nick Neely. These two people should be fired immediately, and they should be sent to the DA's office to be prosecuted for murder. This, this is the type of thing... You, you don't want to have any, any kind of justice here, do you? The way you look around and everything, your attitude, is your, you have a crass attitude and you're followed. You either picked that up as, as an a, as a officer how long ago is that you were here, used to be in Rampart, and you still have that crass attitude, the way you're looking is back and forth, back and forth, and you don't care Thank about you for your what's comments, going on sir. with the people. And you know, we need to get rid of people like Soboroff off this commission, the other commissioners. Okay. Thank you, know, you for I your was comments, shocked sir. And surprised, and, I'm, and I give you credit for coming out and, and talking about these cases. It's very important that you do that. And But, hey, okay. you that, have the right your time to is say up. We your time is up, sir. The chief if you have additional Beck comments, please submit fired. another card for public Mr. comment. Mr. Johnson, if you have, if you have any kind of leadership, please submit another get card rid of for Beck. public comment. Get rid of Vic. Get rid of Vic. Get rid of Vic. Don't be a coward, Johnson. Order, please. Order, please. Any more speakers? We have two more comment cards. We have Terry Wilburn followed by Billy Davenport. Good morning. Good morning. I don't want you to retire, Chief, but thank you for uh, because the same thing is happening in North Car uh, North Carolina. They asking the chief there to return but the thing is uh, we have people who are working in the banks who are stealing property not only that they have safe deposit box and taking that they then they go to the courts and threaten the judges I threatened I had to threaten one judge because he is getting kidnapped too many times to not decide I had to threaten a, a federal judge who was my cousin because he said he would lock up one of my uh, grandchild. Because of that, that child played an attorney but did 
change the papers back to his, his cell and then burglarize the home. These are the, the people who's in the banks taking zillions of dollars every day through these banks. Some got kidnapped. I would like to leave these with you in the federal bureau. Also, I had officers who would help me but got kidnapped. Officers who followed these people and did their job from one place, Hollywood, to Long Beach or here. Black Lives Matters only consists when they take money and pay the officers to do their dirt, okay? Because this is what's already said, all right? And then also the Bible from what is written in the communities. They may not know their activities of social work that's under your eyelids or eyebrow, but the facts are the facts. And I would like to leave these here the for these people to be apprehended. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Next Billy speaker, please. Davenport, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Billy Davenport. I'm an active member of the community. Uh, and I, as I can see, most of these people are here because they'd like to see a change in the community, and these are positive people here. However, we are all still grouped into being criminals. And, you know, for this being my first time and being able to see this, it looks like we're speaking to a bunch of robots with no feeling, no compassion, no empathy. We're all humans here. We're supposed to have compassion for each other, officers and the community. We're supposed to be working together because your life and the things that matter in your lives are the same things that matter in ours. You don't want your kids out getting murdered just like we don't. You know what I mean? I work for a living and I still get antagonized by the police and I pay taxes. I don't do a liquor crime. I go to work every single day, six days a week, two jobs to take care of my family and myself. It says up here that you guys are supposed to protect and serve, but now it looks like we need the protection from the people that are supposed to be protecting us. And for you to be patting Chief Beck on the back for a drop in a statistic that's not even supposed to be a statistic anyway. It's very rude and disrespectful. We are not, I, I, I can't cheer for a statistic that's not, that nobody is supposed to be murdered. No one is supposed to be killed. There's not supposed to be a statistic for that. But I just wanted to get up and speak my piece. I'm not going to take up too much of you folks' time. But when you guys go home, I want you to feel the, feel the common compassion in your heart, the things that you like to do when you eat your popcorn, when you drop down to being a regular human being again. I want you to see what those feelings feel like when you look at those people's faces on the TV that you don't care nothing about. Thank you for your comments. We're now on item number three, regular agenda items. We do have one card on 3A, two cards on 3B, and one card on 3C. Okay, we'll, call, we'll call each of the items, please. Each item. well, b before you call, comment like reports on each of the items. Would you like me to call the items, sir? W reports on each item, please. Okay. 3A, Inspector General's report dated September 21st, 2016, relative to the video inspection, Central Bureau Divisions. Morning, Morning, President Johnson, members of the commission. The Office of the Inspector General in November conducted its second inspection of body-worn video deployment after it was deployed in the Central Bureau. Uh, while we were visiting the bureaus, we also took the opportunity to again inspect the video from digital in-car video. Our findings were essentially that uh, the activations were generally good for the units in which the body-worn video was deployed, Newton, Central, specialized details. Um, the numbers could have been higher, but we recognize that this was a 90-day grace period. 
And part of the purpose of our conducting the inspection during that grace period was to help provide the command officers with feedback about how the officers were activating and where problem areas might be. We also commented on the quality of the video obtained because the cameras at that time were worn in two different locations, either on the belt or on the chest. Uh, our subjective observations that the chest mounted videos were of better quality. We're aware from training from the department that the vendor is coming out with a new mount and we've asked for the department to provide the commission with more information regarding that mount. Uh, we also noted a problem in finding the videos. They're stored on a vendor site called evidence.com and when either we or uh, supervision would look to find the videos. They're not at that time consistently logged. The department has provided training asking officers to log them by incident number, but our finding was that was inconsistently done and it's not required by policy. Uh, but again, we're aware, we know that the department is aware of the problem. They've discussed it with us and we know that they were talking with the vendor about developing a download to make it automatic so that the officers would not either be free to do it or not do it, but that the data would be automatically downloaded into the system. And we again asked the department to report to you on the progress of that download. Uh, secondly, when we looked at the digital in-car video, uh, those systems have been around longer and we found higher compliance. Uh, in almost all of the cases, officers did record the tran arrestee transports as they're required to do. Uh, and in almost all of the cases, uh, arrestees were properly seat belted as they are required to be. In the cases where the arrestees were not belted, we provided the information feedback to the command officers of those uh, involved officers. Uh, we're aware that the department is also working on fusing the policies from digital in-car video and body-worn video because they initially were developed as separate systems, yet they have common issues, and we've asked the department to report to you on the progress of fusing those policies. I'm available for any questions if you have them. Thank you. Did you have uh, information on the, on the mount? I, I do not have specific information on the mount. It is getting through the process. The okay. uh, Office of Operations is moving forward with that to make the transition from the belt up into the uniform shirt. So that is happening. Commissioner Sergeant Gomez can, can add some uh, clarity to that. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. So, Commissioner, um, we do have a new mount. I'm actually wearing it today. It's on the chest. It is a magnet mount that's uh, um, very simple for the officers to use. In fact, uh, we started to receive our shipment, and I can report today that um, Hollenbeck is the first division of the original uh, deployment that is being switched. And by the end of the week, we anticipate the entire uh, 1,100 that are currently deployed to be swapped out to the new magnet mount. I'm sorry, by when? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, to the new magnet mount. We have order, please. So they simply attach to the uniform using this uh, device here. The officers simply slide it in, they rotate it, and then it's affixed to the uniform. Um, it's much simpler, and again, it allows it to be more center body, and this particular camera does not have a um, belt option, so it's only mounted on the center uniform. And there's an, as part of the training, the, the bottom of the camera is no lower than the bottom of the pocket and center mounted. Great, thank you. I don't have any further questions. Any other questions? When's our next uh, report? Uh, when's our next audit? We're currently engaged in auditing Hollenbeck's body-worn video, so that will probably be out in two or three months, your calendar permitting. Uh, and we continually are auditing digital in-car video as part of those as well. So you can expect to see regular reports from us uh, over the next several months. Fantastic. And you're going to continue on with the, after the 90-day training period. Yes, we are. Uh, our tolerance for not turning it on on time or turning it off on time? Yes, our expectation, and I'm sure yours is as well, that after the 90-day training period that we would expect the compliance numbers to be much higher uh, because there will be a consequence for officers not complying with video Good. or with policy at that point in time. And then also, Mr. Silberoff, besides the Inspector Generals, uh, within Central Bureau, as all bureaus, we're also doing self-audits uh, to make sure that we adhere to the policies and procedures that are implemented. Uh, just to give you a quick example that for the DICV, uh, we looked over 622 for videos for Central. Uh, in Central Division, we looked over 2,160. Uh, for Newton Division, we looked over 1,469 videos that were pulled by the specific units. For the body-worn video, uh, for Central Traffic, we pulled 2,766. For Central Division, we pulled and audited 3,142 random. And then for Newton Division, we pulled 2,498 and, and inspected those randomly also. We agree and concur with the IG's finding uh, the new technology is something we are striving to uh, work better with and achieve. 
Uh, Chief Beck uh, recently set out on September the 21st a, uh, a new policy, Office of the Chief of Police notice that again articulates the fact that officers are expected when to activate, when not to activate. So again, with this new technology and this new standard and trying to meet the goals of the chief uh, to ensure that we show a level of transparency on all that we're doing, there's multiple levels of things that are in place to address those. And will you explain a little bit about the automatic activation based on code three, like that happens with the in-car? Yeah, the difference between the, the DICV is when it goes to a code three, uh, when the, the lights and sirens go on, it automatically turns on. We're seeing again, and that's what the, the chief's message was on his notice, is that on some pedestrian stops, there's no need to activate the lights and the sirens. And so the officers have an expectation where they're going to have to activate that manually sure. to capture the front. And then also now what we're finding is a lot of, and it was talked about by the IG's audit, um, our officers are, are being videoed in multiple different ways. Besides the body-worn video, the DICV is also going. And so there's two systems that they have to activate before they make contact with these individuals that they come in contact with, no matter what the call for service is. So again, that's a, a technology and that's a new standard. It's a new practice. But again, the chief has modeled what he wants to see achieved. And uh, we're here to support that and make sure that happens. And with these auditing, that's where we're doing it. Uh, the first 90 days that he mentioned was captured, but we did a self-audit within Central Bureau to verify that we are entering these items that are uh, issues for us in our learning management system. And we have a good record of entering those and, and teaching and instructing our officers so that they can succeed in the future. And my last question for Sergeant Gomez. Dan, um, the future, technology changing, um, is our department feeding information to the different manufacturers, to our, our, our experiences, so it will help um, with new technology? And what do you think, you, you know, what do you see in the horizon? Yeah, Commissioner, we absolutely are. In fact, the camera that we're deploying now has many of the changes that we asked for, which includes um, um, some of the technology that allows us to do some of those um, activations. So for instance, in this new body camera, which wasn't available in the beginning, will allow for us to tie into the vehicles as well. So then when uh, we activate a light bar, it will not only activate the in-car video system, but will also activate the body camera system. So that was technology just two years ago that we pushed um, as an organization that we thought would be um, useful um, and better for our officers. Um, I think what we're also seeing, commissioners, is that the, the technology is just getting better in general. And so we're seeing better video quality. Um, what we're seeing is that we're the back office system in terms of how the video is uploaded, the quickness of it, the, the ability to add a lot more information to it to help with these audits and other learning lessons for training are all progressing really, really quickly. And, and the, the market is saturated with body-worn technology and competition is high and that's good for the organization, good for the city. And when will we be fully implemented in, in our department? So we've, uh, we're striving to meet the chief's goal of being uh, implemented in early 2018, having all 7,000 cameras deployed. Um, we've already started now. The infrastructure is being built now. Um, we're already doing the swap. So it is all part of the process. Um, there's clearly a training component that goes with it as well as, as the infrastructure to make sure the, the divisions can support the cameras. But that has been in progress since the moment we signed the contract a few months ago. We've been working uh, at every station. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other, any other uh, commissioner questions? Can we call the uh, public comments, please? Yeah, we have Jojo Smith, Hamid Khan, and Mariela Saba. Jojo Smith with the Stop LAP Spy and Coalition. These, these body, these cameras are just flawed, period. I mean, the officers can turn them on and off when they want to, so when when a person's killed when a per, when they like you said if, if they don't turn on the sirens it's not activate i'm sorry if we're paying all this money it should be on 24 7. it should because these officers talk about what they're doing so they can change the reports once they watch it that's ridiculous that part right there make it you can always, we need to look at the nation. There's been more killings with these body cameras than when, before we had them because in 2012, I was beat down in Pasadena by Pasadena police. They had body cameras. You know what they've done? They put their arm over them and said, stop resisting while they're punching us in the face. 
as they're punching us in the face, they're blocking the camera saying, stop resisting, stop resisting. When we're getting beat down because we weren't even resisting, they were just beating the hell out of us. So these cameras are bullshit. We need to get some better equipment for the city and start putting these officers that kill people in prison. Hamid Khan. So in uh, April of uh, 2014 or 15, last year, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition released a report rejecting the use of body cameras because this is an empty reform that will expand the surveillance state. It's very simple and straightforward. And I'm not sure if this audit is only for the activation, if the button goes on and off, or is it about the real implementation of the program? Shango is sitting over here, and Bustamante is missing in action. But what we see is, and it's, it's so just be prepared, because what we have is a smoke screen and a snake oil sales in operation right now. Because when you look at it, even when you look at this, this audit, um, so they talk about traffic stops. They are in compliance. Okay, they are in compliance. But let's look at the specialized detail arrests, central area. Of the 37 officers, two 5% activated body-worn cameras for the entire incident. Only 5%. Two out of 37. So now, this is basically when we talk about use of force, when the arrest is going to take place, when we talk about stop resisting, when we talk about you got my hand on the gun, when you talk about he's pulling uh, on my holster, this is what is happening that is happening during the arrest. At that point, two out of 37 were in compliance and had it on for the entire incident. Then they said 65% uh, activated for part of the incident and 30% apparently did not activate at all during the arrest. So in essence, 95% of these incidents clearly in the audit are stating that they were not on for the whole time. Now, if this is really a, a real audit, then let's look at the recommendations because the recommendations are bogus to begin with. Yeah. It's about wear it above your belt. What happens, was, was the audit done because the policy states that the cops can review footage before they file the report. Was there any audit done of that? Was there audit, the, the policy says that all background footage can be used as evidence. Was there audit done on that? It says that facial recognition technology will be applied to body camera footage as, there, as well. Was there audit done on that? And lastly, Thank you for your comments, Mr. I'll Khan. finish there right there. Lastly, because Palantir hovers all over the place, was there any interfacing of the data collected with any other systems? These are the big questions, Cynthia McLean Hill, that we brought up in one of the audits, and this is what is going on, that there's a smoke screen that is being created. So this is hey, not thank you real, for your again, comments, a real Mr. audit. Khan. It is just a report, so let's call it one of those. Good morning. Good morning. Body cameras are a mockery to the pain that is felt worldwide and throughout the United States. Body cameras are a mockery to the pain that is felt here in this room from the mothers who speak out, who cry out, still crying out for help. They're a mockery. How dare this police department and all the police departments across the U.S. co-opt that good word transparency, like I see you, that good word, and use it to disguise more lies. If we were really transparent, then I would envision police officers with their hands up, disarming. They would let go and they would reject all the more tools that they're gi given to kill, to document the murder, and to laugh at communities because they're the ones who get to see the footage. So it's a mockery to the pain that is experienced in the streets. I can imagine what it would be like if we didn't spend $57 million in LA in the next five years on body cameras. I can imagine what it would be like to have um, video cameras for children, for youth, to help tell the stories of the truth that is happening on the ground and the kind of justice that that would bring to our streets. You continue to arm a police department, brother with the gun and the camera, 
It doesn't matter what angle or if you put it on your forehead, on your heart, on your chest, or anywhere, on your, on your butt. You can put it anywhere. The footage is going to show the deep racism that is every interaction between police and community in the streets. It's going to show the deep sexism, that ev the deep brutality, the violence. It doesn't matter what angle you get, that's what we're going to see. And you don't even let people see it, so it's a mockery. It's a mockery and it's gross and it needs to stop. And you need to disarm body camera, gun, police cars, helicopters, this whole building. It's better for housing for us. The next speaker, Pastor Q. Jen Marie and Billy Davenport. Good morning, Pastor Q. Good Church morning. Church Without Walls, Skid Row, uh, creating justice in the Black Jewish Justice Alliance. There's a text in the book of Proverbs that says, the first one to plead his case seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. And as it relates to body cameras, one of the greatest problems we have with body camera, it seems like body cameras are, what w you guys got them to make the community more transparent. And it's supposed to be the other way around, right? We are paying taxes for these body cameras. And so I heard the gentleman said, it makes it easier for our police. I have a question. When are we going to get our accountability apparatus? Because that seems like the body cameras are for the police. We even have in North Carolina, we see how they are trying to suppress whatever happens on body cameras and using the veil of investigation. If witnesses, with, before we even had body cameras, if there are people who witness what happened. They're not going to say, well, I need to hold my information until there's an investigation that is done and then I can release my information. What is the big deal? If there's something that happened, then why are, why does the police get to first of all control? We're supposed to be holding the police accountable and the police already has a job of holding the community accountable. Why does the police get to control the only accountability apparatus? Well, let me tell you, if, you really, if you're really trying or attempting to build community relation, then you have to start there. You have to start being more apparent. And don't tell us about community policing unless you're really ready to do that. Billy Davenport. Good day, folks. Um, I've done some form of management before in my life, so maybe I could share this with my community. In management, sometimes we are able to pull funds together to make a project happen, and we can take some of that money that we would have spent on the apparatus to get maybe, maybe uh, I won't say a cheaper apparatus, but maybe something that's not so cost effective so that we can save money. This seems like another plot to save money and some money that's going into somebody else's pocket because the community, you know, we do have some concerns. Like, number one, how do you, if you walk into a store and you see a camera, a shoplifter can't control that. A shoplifter can't turn that camera off and turn it back on. So if you're looking to observe a particular person, why do you give them the camera that they can control? Not only that, we have no sense of how that video is going to be reviewed or anything before it becomes public knowledge. And, and there's people that, that need to know these things. How do you know yourself being the commission that videos and documents can't be doctored before they even get to you? You know, we, we, we all have questions and concerns, but it seems like everybody is spending the money without our concern. Uh, uh, in in the uh, in the situation, but uh, what I was mainly saying is, you know, you guys got cameras all over here. They're powered, self-powered. They're not controlled by anyone, but they can catch what's going on. What do you think is going to happen when you give control to a criminal 
with a camera that they can control that's supposed to be evidence. We have no other comment cards. Is that the last speaker on this item? That's the last speaker on this item, sir. Do we have a motion to approve the Inspector General's report? Um, um, to approve Inspector General's report. <coughs> Second, but uh, can I ask a question, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, uh, there was a statement made earlier about there being consequences for officers who fail to turn on the camera. Can you share with me what those consequences are? I can. Uh, Hello? The commander probably know them better than I. Yeah. Hello? For the 90-day period, basically. I, um, I, put down, I put a card for this and okay, haven't been called. Is it okay if he's Very important. No. Uh, it's A. It's re regarding the inspector general's report. This is not inspector general's. This is a police report about what they think is right. And as I remember, back in 1995 when it was, I guess, the Clinton administration, they, they put a consent decree on the LAPD. Why was that? Because they were out of, totally out of control. Beck was over there, I think he was in, in Rampart or something, dealing with the question of, of the stolen uh, drugs over there. And now what I see is that the, attorney, the Inspector General's office is castrated. When you take I mean, for the first lady who was the head, the head of the, the, that inspector general's office, she, I used to talk to her because I had cases that I, that I worked on, and she was scared. They intimidated her. They tried to keep her from filing good reports, and that is what's happening in here. You have, you have an insular organization that does what the fuck they like, and they don't care about what, of justice. The, the consent decree was put into effect, and the attorney, the inspector general, part of is part of it was was now it's gone because you have police doing the report of Mr. Busamante. I don't know what happened to him. I guess when he came out with those reports about the the question of people being broken down in terms, I think it was 90, 97 uh, Latinos and and 50, 57 African Americans that, that the LAPD used violence again. What happened to that question? That's a very important question. Dealing with controlling this out of control police department that Beck does not want to do anything about. And the rest of you, this young lady, this lady here, she looks like she did a lot to get this going. And, and I don't know where Johnson is right now. You guys kind of stood up a little bit about these killings, but the rest of it is that this, this department is out of control and that's what you supposedly have the, the inspector general and you don't have it. You, you, you don't have the inspector general. You have five, three cops right here making that report, and that's incorrect. Thank that's you. against what the rules are. Can and, I? You know, I tried, to, I tried to come up here. I, I left my card for may, this may I because I knew a lot about the history. And the D, the, this, this yeah. police department should be under a consent decree again because it's out of control, and the, the city of L.A. is not doing anything. Garcetti is a pushover. He's worthless. Thank and you. The rest of you, Excuse maybe you your, last your, your on that two, your time those is two up. cases that you talked about are Sir, are your time is good. up. Please but, have a seat. But Mr. Johnson, how come you left when this ta this issue came up? It's very important, and you Sir, left. Please That's have, not, please hey, have a seat. If you're going to lead, stick around. Up. Don't run away. Please. Okay. So. Can you yes, ma'am. There's a myriad of controls that are put into place to ensure that the officers are performing as the expectations that are listed in the policies and procedures. Those include uh, first training, then we have counseling and informal meetings, and then there's comment cards, and then notices to correct, and then ultimately there's 128s or complaint investigations. As an example, as we started, yeah, I, I I can't hear you, and I'm not. Sh you have okay. to speak slowly <laughs> for it. me, um, in part because um, it's I don't necessarily understand. Sure. Since I'm not internal to the department, what all of this really entails. So if you could start over, um, you were indicating that there are consequences for failure, and I assume this is just to turn on the device, correct? It, it's for all, it's for activation. If they do activate it, do they turn it off too soon? Uh, is it activated at all? Um, did they have the opportunity to do both the digital in-car video? And mm -hmm. if they did that, did they also do the body-worn video? So there's a number of expectations that the officers have to perform at. 
Okay, and then for failing to, and, and y there's been, um, we keep, I've heard several times about the 90 day period. So are the consequences different after 90 days of training than they are bef during that period? Are there any consequences during that period? Just help me understand how this works. The 90 day period allows them to get acquainted with the equipment, get acquainted with the new technology. And in that period, uh, some of the activation issues, some of the deactivation issues, uh, there, there's more flexibility. Is Once there something particularly complex about turning on the equipment? It, it's, not, it's not particularly complex, but again, uh, the contacts that a lot of these officers have are complex. And so when they're trying to deal with a new technology, at the same time of trying to deal with the situation with the community member, uh, whether it's good, bad, that's, that's the we, issue that we're we trying have to order, get the muscle, muscle memory in our officers we have, have to deal with. Hold, hold on. Okay. Um, Commander Chamberlain, hold on one second. Can we please have order so we can under, we, so we can hear uh, what Commander Chamberlain is is excellent. Yeah. We're hearing lies. <clears throat> Except that I'm not asking him questions so that he can be yes. <laughs> while he responds to them. I'm really asking him questions because I do want to understand the answers. So it would just be helpful if we could do this. Um, can, you please, can, you, no, so can you please stop interrupting? Okay, so after the 90 days, is that the series that you described? Is that what occurs after 90 days if they have not developed the habit, essentially, to turn on the equipment as directed by the chief? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and then, um, thank you for that. Um, and then with respect to the new mount, um, with Sir, respect- you've, you've interrupted now several times. I've asked you to stop interrupting. If, if you interrupt again, I'm going to ask you to leave. Well, you're free to leave anytime you'd like to. So with respect to the new mount, um, can you tell me uh, again what the uh, schedule for replacement of the um, existing uh, equipment is? Yes, ma'am. So we've started today in Hollenbeck. Hollenbeck, uh, is, we have five divisions that are currently deployed with the previous uh, generation cameras and the older mounts. So today we start at Hollenbeck. Tomorrow we will be at Central and Central Traffic replacing theirs. We'll be at Newton Division on Thursday replacing theirs and we're going to attempt to do mission the same day. Um, if we're unable to, we'll do it on the follow-up day. So we're at the end of the deployment period, so the, they're lighter in terms of the number of staffing. So we're trying to maximize the amount of people that we can provide training to, um, but we anticipate that we'd be fully completed by the end of this week. Okay, thank you. And um, the only thing I would say before uh, I, we accept the report is um, that I know that a great deal of effort has been made to ensure that the department is equipped with cameras. Um, and at least from my perspective, uh, the, uh, a great deal of progress has been made based on our ability to substantiate claims by actual um, pictures or video of those occurrences. So I'm encouraged that we have uh, both more video and that we will have mounts in a place where those cameras are more useful in terms of what they're recording. Um, I do just want to signal that um, you know, transparency is a big and important word and it's difficult to be transparent without there being greater access to the videos and, and much sooner. Um, and I look forward to determining how we get from here to there. Thank you. Now, did, did I understand we had a motion and a second on the table? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay, we're now on item number 3B, department's report dated September 22nd, 2016, relative to the recommendations contained in the Office of the Inspector General's investigation of the Los Angeles Police Department Metropolitan Detention Center inmate inspections and safety checks.
can we have order, please? Can we have order, please? Order, please. We are all Okay, thank you. Let's have let's have let's have order so we can hear the report, please. If you have a comment, you're free to submit a card. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Chief Beck, uh, Mr. Sibley, Mr. T. Fank. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to provide this 90-day update um, on uh, follow-up to the Inspector General's report of June 7th. Uh, with regard to recommendations uh, on inmate safety and inspections at the Metropolitan Detention Center. I'm joined here today by Commander Vito Palazzolo um, and also by the commanding officer uh, of Custody Services Division, uh, Captain Tony Odo. Uh, we did submit a report to the Commission with regard to follow-ups on four main areas which were delineated by the Inspector General and they covered policy and procedure, training, technology, and accountability. Um, I know the commissioners uh, were very interested, especially in the training piece, and we uh, did delineate uh, specifics with regard to uh, from the inception of an individual into the training program to become a detention officer, what we've done there, all the way into in-service, staff training, and supervisory training. Uh, Commander Palazzolo and I have made several trips to the uh, Metropolitan Detention Center to ensure that these follow-ups were done. Uh, that included uh, participation in roll calls and supervisory training days. Uh, we are prepared here to answer any questions if there's further inquiries as a result of the written report. I was encouraged by the report. Thank you. Any any Thank you. questions from my fellow commissioners? Thank you. Can we call the how many comments? We, we have, have four comment cards. Please call them. Thank you. The first speaker, Lisa Simpson, Beth Kemp, Ted Hayes, Hamid Khan, and Jojo Smith. I am Waukesha Wilson. I am Waukesha Wilson. I really like how you sit here and tell lies about your safety in the Metropolitan Detention Center. Where was your safety at when they killed Waukesha Wilson? Left her mother on a limb for five days before y'all told her that her daughter was deceased. Y'all didn't even tell her. Y'all had a, gave her a number to call for the coroner to say, L.A. Corner. But you're talking about safety. What is your safety tactics? How are you protecting the people that's in jail? I keep hearing y'all talk about this training, and I am really want to try to figure out what are you training your officers to do, kill? Because I don't see no other kind of training that you guys are doing that's good enough for nobody. You guys talk about your body cams. Oh, yeah, I'm bringing that back up. Because uh, the officers that killed my kid, they had on body cams. They had the uh, video in the cars. But it was kind of strange because none of the three matched they report. So what's the use to having a body cam if you can still lie on paperwork? I hear the officers saying they auditing the body cams. I think they meant to say they editing the body cams. Because you can't audit a body cam and not let nobody else view the body cam that you auditing. So if you got these officers auditing this body cam, they're editing the body cam. They taking out footage and they putting in what they want to put in. Y'all spending all this money on unnecessary stuff. What you need a body cam for when y'all killing people? It's showing y'all killing people, and what is the body cam used for? Because it ain't getting no justice to nobody. You got these people sitting up here talking about the Metropolitan Detention Center. Y'all just killed a female in the Metropolitan Detention Center. Now y'all want to talk about safety five months after she was dead? What happened to the safety five months and a day ago when she was alive? What happened to it then? Y'all just talk about safety and y'all so y'all safe, but we not. <laughs> y'all the only ones that require safetyness. The human people, we don't require that. We don't get that out of y'all. You feel me? Y'all got all these people up here playing like they really doing something. Oh, now you know we're doing inspections, making them do their job. When you could just tell them a simple word. Stop killing blacks and Hispanics. 
Thank it's not that hard. Thank you for your comments. Simple. We need to move on to the next speaker. It's simple. You always say that, Mr. Johnson. I know I do. You know me and you had a talk and all that, but you got to keep it real, though. They, 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 they pull, you know, they're telling you lies, player. they telling you what you want to hear, and you accepted it. Oh, everybody that's in favor, say aye. Well, I'm not in favor of shit y'all talking about. Okay. So I'm going to say nay to everything. Okay. Thank you. The next speaker, Beth Kemp. First, I'd like to say, I don't know who this man is in the blue suit, but Ms. McLean Hill, he's filming specifically you and texting back and forth with someone, which is very concerning. So, oh, interesting. Well, as, as Lisa said, you know, Waukesha was murdered in, in Metro, and now you're saying, oh, well, we did inspections and it's all fine and it's all safe. Well, I want to know how those inspections were done. Were they announced? Did they know you were coming? Did you go in as an inmate? Did you send someone in as an inmate to see how they were treated? Okay, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, stop the clock. Excuse me, please, please, you need to have a seat. Excuse me, if you are standing, you need to have a seat. But that's because you're filming people. If you, are, if you are standing, you need to have a seat. You make me, you make me worried about her safety. Ma'am, ma'am. If you do not have a seat right now, I'm going to ask you to leave. Ma'am, if you do not have a seat right now, I'm going to ask you to leave. I need you to have a seat. I need you to have a seat. Ma'am, if you do not have a seat, um, this, is my, this is your last warning. If you do not have a seat, I'm going to ask you to, I'm talking to you. You need to have a seat. You're blocking the view of the people behind you. Thank you. Okay, let's have let's let's have order and let's go back to the speaker, please. No one is prevented from filming in this room. I see multiple people with cameras right now. No one is prohibited. You can film whoever you want. You can film me all day. You can film whoever you want. Every, all right, we, we need to have order so we can continue with the meeting, please. He didn't do anything wrong. We are going to continue the meeting. Please stop with the disruption. Okay. Uh, surely we can't all be this disturbed by a single individual I think, I, no, 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 I, if, if, if he's here for me, I'm good. So I just as soon listen to the speaker and have some conversation about the matter at hand, which is the jails, which is critically important. Okay. So, you know, let him film. It's, it's all good. Okay, we, we need to have order right now, and we're going to recontinue the meeting. Sir, 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 we need to continue the meeting. Please, please restart the clock. Well, he did, you know, he did actually put a scare into all of us because of the way he's targeting you. Um, but on, the, on another note, on the jail, you know, you talk about safety, and yet these reports are done probably with people who are just walking in already announced that they're coming, and that's bullshit. You know, I know it's not safe in jail. I have friends who are black, who are brown, who are transgender, and you know what happens when you're transgender and you go to jail? You go into a unit with the people with the sex you were born in. So someone who identifies as a woman but is born as a male is go going to get raped or injured in jail because they are put into a jail with men despite the fact that they're already undergoing changes and don't identify as such. If you want to make jails safer, you're going to close them down. You're going to stop this insanity. I watched 33 people get arrested and sit in Metro and then some get transferred to county for chalking on a sidewalk in 2012. So when you want to talk about so making jail safer, stop putting people in jail for unarrestable offenses. That's a good start. Stop putting bullshit, you know, uh, report backs about how you inspected a jail without inspectors who are not related to the police department. Like, we need real inspections. We need to be allowed to send community members in as 
inmates so they can give a real report back on what is going on and what the situations are because these abuses are going to continue and you know what while Keisha Wilson's mother Lisa has still gotten no answers from you and this is bullshit she needs justice for her daughter and not one more person should be dying in jail Ted Hayes Ted, the next speaker, Ted Hayes, please, followed by Hamid Khan and Jojo Smith. You're discussing a prelude to our death in jail, but it's the aftermath that should be talked about. Section 152, accidental death, knowledge, and consumment, misdemeanor. Four days after she died, it was reported it was, she was told to contact the coroner's office. Here's what the law says. Every person who having knowledge of an accidental uh, death actively uh, conceals or, or, or attempts to conceal the death shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Uh, uh, punishable by imprisonment to county jail for a year. For purpose of, of this section, to actually, 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 actually conceal an accidental death means any of the following. To perform an overt act that conceals the body or directly impedes ability of the authorities or the family members to discover the body. So the family members did not discover the body for or uh, hear any information about the body except from the coroner's office. But the persons who related that information to the family members were police officers, were the persons who discovered the death and did not report it to the family. So these are the things that count. The police department, the police officers that discovered her body should have reported that. And the higher echelon, the guys with the stars and the bars and the stripes should have passed it on to the family. This is section 152. That's what it says. Then I mentioned section uh, 12525 about having to make that information public and being passed on to the state attorney general. None of that was done. So it's the aftermath that should be talked about. The, both these sections indicate it's a crime for the police department or police officers to do these things. Those are the things that you must be discussing. Section 122, 125, and section 12525. It also says that in March, three months earlier, all supervisors at all custody facilities had now been trained. So they had been trained completely three months earlier in March, but in June, the OIG found 83% out of compliance, right? So keep that in mind as well. Then there says, and this is Beck's report back, then it says in May, which was a month and a half before June, or a month before June, May 9th, the, the Board of State and Community Corrections had also conducted a comprehensive edit of the facility along with adherence to state po law policy and procedure. So this kind of bullshit where, you know, you have in June the OIG saying that 83% uh, were not in compliance, but in March all supervisors had been trained, and in May the state finds thing in compliance. So what is going on over here? I mean, Matt Johnson, you were satisfied with the report. Did you read the report? Did you did you read the report, Matt, Matt Johnson? I'm asking you a question. Did you read the report? I'm not going to dignify that. Well, it's not a matter of dignifying that. No. I mean, did you? Is there? Can can somebody can then can can these folks answer my question? Because people want to know that what is what is going on? Because in in June the OIG finds them out of compliance. In March supposedly they had to be trained, and in May the state board gives them a pass. No answers. You see? That's why we see LAPC fails. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, Jojo Smith. Jojo Smith lost would stop LAP spying coalition. We know that you're gonna gonna stamp this. But Waikisha Wilson died in their custody. She was murdered in their custody.
that part. So we sit here and we listen to what they say. But they're going to just going to do a stamp. I, I, I. Always I, I, I. We're not, this is a failed body. Failed body. Chief Beck, you need to resign. You're doing nothing for this community. You're doing nothing for none of the communities, but allowing your officers to kill people. You're not putting them up on charges. If I go and kill somebody, I am being charged with murder. With murder. Mr. Smith, you're off topic. No, it's not off topic. It isn't off topic. That part. Because we, we sit here every time, every day, every Tuesday, and listen to all this bullshit. Because y'all just going to stamp, stamp, stamp. So we have no other comment cards, sir? I'm sorry, what was that? We have no other comment cards on this item. Do I have a motion to approve <laughs> item 3B? It's a motion um, to receive and file. I'll second. Yeah, can I just point out one thing with respect to the report, and it's a little confusing, but the June 7th date <laughs> is actually the date that the um, Inspector General presented his report to the board. It's not the timing of when um, his investigation was conducted, so that's why the timeline seems a little out of, out of whack. Um, and again, it's just written in a way that's that's confusing on that point. So but no, no, I I understand. I just wanted to point out that the conclusion that's being drawn that the determination of the inspector general. Um, follows in uh, significant respects um, the uh, department's ability to, or the, the, the department's efforts to um, improve what was clearly a deficient process is just, is just not correct. I'm, I'm not suggesting um, by any stretch of the imagination that the deficiency is something that should not um, have, you know, been should never have existed and that there were not consequences. I'm simply saying that, again, we've got to, um, we can call out what we think is wrong, but we do have to make room for efforts to make progress or to improve. We just have to. Doesn't change what occurred, doesn't change things that are wrong, but we absolutely do have to work toward and acknowledge when work is taking place to improve and that's really all no and you know again I'm not trying to defend the report I, I read them and sometimes it's very confusing for me to understand what's happening in the context of all of these moving pieces um, but no, this is this is just a receive and file. This is simply a progress update, and I guess what we will say, or what I would say, is that I continue to be interested in understanding um, what's occurring and progress uh, to the extent that it can be reported. Um, and to that point, I agree with um, Commissioner Johnson that um, a lot has been happening and. Uh, we expect that progress to continue. So that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Um, do we need a motion on this, Mr. T. Fink? Yes, yeah, just to receive and file, yes, sir. Okay, do I have a motion to receive and file the department report? Do I? Yes, do second. I have a second? All in favor? No. Any opposed? Thank you. Now I. Do, do any of my fellow commissioners want a report on item 3C, or can we just go right to comments? Comment. We, we'll just go right to comments on item Okay, we have one comment card on 3C. We have Beth Kemp. Thank you for the report. Okay, so we're talking about an application and award for National Inst Institute of Justice's 2016 DNA Capacity Enhancement and Backlog Reduction Program. 
So what that talks about is murders and rapes. Right now we're sitting in the, the rape capital of Los Angeles, the Central Division. You know that you're talking about a backlog when most rapes aren't even reported because they know nothing happens, okay? And I talk to women every day on the street in Skid Row who've been raped that week, that day, and they don't report it. Why? Because they're terrified of your officers, okay? I've watched Hollywood Division officers at 4 o'clock in the morning assaulting a transgender woman with their hands up her skirt, bent over the police car. The only reason they stopped is because I launched off the bus with a camera in my hands and they drove away before I could even get their license plate number. This happens every day. How many rapes go unreported because they're against officers and what do you do when you find it's an officer's DNA in your database? What do the officers who are looking at the DNA do? You know, you talk about a backlog. If you're going to be hiring cops, then why don't you hire the cops who actually do something, who are scientists, who are looking at this DNA and finding a crossover, not five years and finding the guy raped 25, 35, 45 women, but finding them immediately, finding out, like, okay, we have this backlog, so hire people to do that instead of criminalizing the unhoused, instead of criminalizing black and brown communities, and instead of harassing protesters in the street because you know what if you're not aware into the end of 2011 beginning of 2012 there was an art project right out front of this fucking building and it was a rape board it showed skid row in downtown LA and every time a woman got raped it got stamped it had almost 200 within two weeks we lost count because it was unable with all the stamps on it to tell how many rapes had actually occurred we have no other comment cards on this item, sir. Do I have a motion to approve the department's report? So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're now on item number four, public comment period. We have 19 comment cards. Okay. The first four speakers, Jamie McBride, DA. Francis Jenkins and Paula Minor. So before before we uh, before we start with the with the speakers, I want to remind everybody that if we have ten or more speakers, I can cut the time down to to one minute. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep it at two minutes, but I expect everybody to honor the two minutes. If if we if we can't if we if you if we don't, then in the future that may impact whether or not. Uh, we give the two full minutes. I also expect that whether you agree with the speaker or not, you will give them the respect of the microphone and give them their two minutes uninterrupted. The Brown Act protects everyone's First Amendment rights. Does not give us the ability to shut anyone down if we don't like what they, uh, what they are saying. And likewise, I expect the audience members to give, give the same <laughs> level of respect to the people at the podium. If you disagree, with anything that someone at the podium has said, if you disagree with something that has happened on this commission, if you disagree with anything of the department, then please submit your speaker card and you will have your two full minutes. Thank you. My name is Jamie McBride. I'm a director of the Los Angeles Police Protective League. Your recent decision in the Guzman matter was a travesty and will put Los Angeles police officers in danger. In that incident, the suspect, armed with a knife, closed the distance from 70 feet to five feet in a matter of 12 seconds before the officer fired his weapon to protect himself, his partner, and the community. Backing up or redeploying was not an option in this case. An armed suspect walking freely on a public sidewalk would have allowed that suspect to enter any open business and cause harm to the community. Then this board would have criticized those officers for not acting sooner. The mayor is setting a stage to have a Los Angeles police officer killed by being reckless in appointing commissioners who are anti-police activists with their own agendas and biases. This commission is no longer focused on fact-finding or truth-seeking. It has become nothing more than reckless individuals hell-bent on pointing fingers at police officers for doing their jobs instead of solving, pro solving problems. Can I have order, please? Your message is loud and clear. The safety of police officers is not your priority and they will be seriously injured or killed if they follow your deadly policies. Now an officer has to decide, should I save my job or should I save my life because I can't do both? Oh. 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 Don't quit. Don't get too dumb. 
Next speaker, please. DA. Greetings, my name is DA, I'm a local Rastafarian. Today I would like to talk about real change and what it looks like. Racists within the LAPD and its supporters have no intention of actually changing. They take it as a given that they are protect protecting white wealthy communities because they are inherently more humane and civil. When they are not, that is something that you know when you know people from both communities. Racist and uh, racists within LAPD and its supporters Take it as a given that they must antagonize blacks and Latinos in order to, for richer, whiter communities to be safe and secure when they do not. The truth is that the racial tension from un ongoing unjust shootings by police is likely to drag this country down into martial law, especially if Trump is forced into office as George W. Bush was forced into office by jingoist forces. From there. Order, please. Fire chief back. Fire chief Order, please. Fire chief back. Real change, however, is individual officers holding each other accountable out of pride for the job. When officers shot Norma Guzman dead instead of preparing to taser her as they were instructed. These individual officers should have been shamed for being criminals with no honor instead of being honored and protected by other officers shamelessly. Having no active standards and ethics means that no one in the society will take you seriously. The brass can do whatever it will, but when individual officers do not care about keeping their fellow officers true to the trade they have supposedly committed themselves to, then no one in the public will listen to you anymore. Take pride in your job. Fight crime and not politics. No secret police. 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 Can no no you call the next speaker, please? Prentice Jenkins. Prentice Jenkins, City Life newsletter publisher, activist since 1991. You know, as an activist back in the 90s, I had some real um, I spewed some real rhetoric. I ran. I was up at uh, construction sites calling black people uh, white man's niggas, and calling white contract, calling black contractors that, and calling white contractors racist. And the black contractor who was on the line, who was actually on the line protesting, said, w "What's this about?" He said. Uh, I, I negotiated my own deal, and I hired some of the, the black people that were on the line. He said, what's this about? This is about black people getting jobs. It's about your ego. Now, that really pissed me off, because it was about my ego. <laughs> See, you can attack my politics, my religion. You can attack me, but don't attack my ego. My ego's never wrong. Anytime I fly, I have to fly coach, but my ego flies first class. I have to buy the ticket. <laughs> it's the truth. So the reality is this. Nobody's going anywhere. Chief's not going anywhere. Activists not going anywhere. The most important thing is compromise. Malcolm X was on this side. White America was on this side. Martin Luther King was right in the middle. Martin Luther King says there's got to be some compromise. Malcolm X did not like that. Malcolm X says there's got to be war. And, Mount, Mount, and Martin said, no, it can't be war, because you will lose that war. There's no saying. There's a song that says, I fought the law, and the law won. Well, the law is going to win every time. It's got more weapons. It's, it's got more weapons. The most important thing is compromise on both sides and, and, and building bridges. Because the, yeah, the only way to do this is to build a bridge. If we don't build bridges, things are going to collapse in on us. The Thank next speaker time. is Paula Miner, followed by Kai Utsumi and Jojo Smith. Um, 
I want to raise the issue of Mr. Soboroff's disrespect for the public. I understand that he did apologize and also recognize that he apologized to the public last, but the evidence of his disrespect has been growing. The reason that people shout out, shut up Steve, is because a few months ago he did tell one of the people who was speaking to the commission to shut up. You know, every time we are here, there's that look of disdain. Frequently, there is that disrespect. We understand what happened with the two commissioners with Sobroff and uh, Commissioner McLean Hill. But also, when you left the room, that Mr. Soboroff gave this group the finger as he was going out. So, Mr. Johnson, as you continue to plea for respect from us, I would ask that you also plea for respect from the commissioners. And lastly, I do want to say, whoever's responsible, we thank you for removing the barriers so that people can enter from the first street entrance. Kai Utsumi. I have an article here by the uh, L.A. Sentinel, uh, September 8th. What is White Lives Matter? This is an incident in Houston where White Lives Matter, with their banner and the Confederate flag, protested in front of the Houston NAACP and called them racist as they flew not only the American flag, but the Confederate flag, segregationist, racist. And these, all these men, these white men, they're not dressed like the KKK, but they sure do think like the KKK, and they call the NAACP a racist organization. I want to go back to yesterday's uh, debate where Donald Trump says, I have been, I am, uh, uh, the paternal order of the police is backing my nomination. The paternal order of the police is a national organization. And I'm wondering, all these police killings nationally with impunity over and over, Ferguson, all over, Minnesota, Baltimore, Texas, all these killings, they don't get convicted. They don't get tried. It's all in policy. Is this because of the fraternal order of police? Do the fraternal order of the police have an office or two or several in this building? That's what I'm wondering. Is he controlling who becomes, uh, what, the, uh, what the police chief acts like? That's a question I'm raising. Does he have control over all of you people? Thank you for your comments. The, the last, the last. Sir, as I noted, we have 19 speakers. Well, I'm giving sir, everyone the, two, the, their full two minutes. This police commission should read the book, Black Wall Street, of the last, uh, the, the killing of a, a black community that sir give, please give the other other speakers their opportunity to by speak by the fraternal order in the last depression next speaker please jojo smith jojo smith followed by lisa simpson jojo smith for los angeles community action network you know matt you you you, you threaten us and threaten us every week like but you ain't threaten him when he shoots us a bird. You didn't, you allow this guy here to threaten people, but you didn't send him out. Like, he was all in the man's face, telling him to sit down. You didn't tell him to sit down. You telling her, telling her to sit down. But that's right, you, you work for the, you work for the racism. You work for the white man. You sit here, and you, you you don't do nothing. All you're doing is stamp, stamp, stamp. Why don't y'all get some real power and do some real work? 
Because all I see is bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Let me stamp. Let me stamp. Let me stamp. What is the stamping doing? Just allowing LAP to keep doing the fuck they want to do. Lisa Simpson, followed by Beth Kemp. I want to ask you a question, Mr. Johnson. What are them three people on the panel for? Because I never hear them say I, nay, nothing. They just, what are they, just prongs on your chest game? Because they just sit there and they don't say nothing. They don't have no voice. All she says is the next person on the thing is, what about the mother two? What are they here for? It's, it's crazy to me. Like, I look across this whole panel. You feel me? And it's just sad. Y'all the only two blacks on this panel, and they killing all our people, and y'all sit up here and vote for the shit that they put up. I already know what's up. Y'all don't have no control. Y'all don't have no power. See, they took y'all power away from y'all before either one of you got on the commission board. See, the commission board used to be powerful. See, the commission board used to stop these police acts, this wrongdoing that they doing. But see, they overpowered y'all by having this cat right here, Steve, you feel me? He ain't for y'all. He for the police people. Y'all are nothing but people that they sit up here to appease the people. I'm not appeased. There's no good cops. Because if it was a good cop, they couldn't walk in this building knowing every day they come to work, they, they fellow officers and kill somebody kid. So I don't see a good cop. I ain't never seen one in my life. What is a good cop? Because if I was a police officer, I couldn't come in this building every day knowing that they kill somebody kid. Because I would have that much com compassion that I would feel what that parent feel. Even though it ain't my kid. You looking at a kid, somebody that didn't even get to enjoy life, didn't even get to go out there and see what life was really about. Because y'all officers took their life. They taking lives on a daily. And y'all just sit up here and have a board meeting because y'all want to hear what the people got to say. But in actuality, do any of y'all really care? Do y'all really care? Do you have a conscience? When you go home after all this day of work, because I know it's your paycheck, do you really sit at home and be like, damn, that is sad, though. They're killing all these people, and we sit up here, and we uphold it right along with the police. We only say stuff to suffice the people, but y'all not helping. It's going on three months. When somebody going to tell me something? Y'all let Chief back leave and then put more up here. He's a habitual liar, so you know I ain't trying to hear nothing he got to say. It's just sad that this is how y'all consider this. Act. This is a community. This is what y'all call it, right? This is a community. This is not a community. It's not. Because guess why? The people of the community are not involved in the community. It's the police. It's not a community. It's only way it's going to be a community, the police and the people got to commute the community. We don't want your police community, community, not communities no more. Send them somewhere else. We got our own people. We can police our own communities because we're not going to kill each other like how y'all killing us. You feel me? Thank you for your comment. Yeah, for real, though, Mr. Johnson, you should really take that in consideration, though, on the real, because you the president, but that don't mean shit to these people that's on this board with you. You're nothing to them. You're just a person. He got more power than you got, and you the president. Now, you tell me how that look. Oh, because he white, he right. I forgot. Look at him with his bald head. Call the next speaker, please. The next speaker, Beth Kemp, followed by Tiffany Guerra and David Sanchez. Over and over again today, uh, the commission spoke and the police spoke about change, about how, oh, we're changing, we're changing, we're changing. I call bullshit. I say it's all just appeasing. You're just changing your language and adopting ours to sound as if you're doing something. Um, you know, if you really want to do something, how about dropping the charges against the two people who are facing charges next month for getting arrested at police commission meetings, one of which you accused him of grabbing an officer's gun come on like seriously a 68 year old man and you accused and he's being accused of grabbing an officer's gun another one of those people is sitting in the room right now not going to put him on blast but seriously you need to drop the charges if you want to make changes start with that another thing that i've noticed is you know i've been doing a lot of searching online to find out about policies and procedures and it seems that lapd doesn't put their policies or procedures online they don't put their training manuals online so we really have no idea how people are being trained and the little things that we do find out like like they're being trained by the Israeli army is very terrifying because the Israeli army has one job 
to murder every Palestinian person. So right now, you're telling us by these actions that black and brown communities need to be erased like Palestinians do. Like the same way the racist Israeli Nazi government does, you're doing the same thing. And I'm Jewish and I say that. Okay, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting for me to sit here week after week and listen to mothers demand accountability and months and months, if not years, go by and they get none. You know, and then people who speak out like Sibo the rapper get hemmed up on fake charges where, you know, if you didn't know, they did his lineup in the street. That's how he was convicted. A street lineup. Is that even legal? And he's facing more charges that we're just finding out about. This is absolutely disgusting. And this all needs, not a change, this needs to end. The police department as we know it needs to be abolished. Tiffany Guerra, followed by David Sanchez. Okay. Good morning. Hi. So I was thinking this morning how frustrating and inefficient it is that we, the public, have to come down here every Tuesday morning and ask that you live up to the promises that you've made. Uh, Matt Johnson, when you took the chair last year, you laid out a number of initiatives to support your goals of reducing crime and reducing the use of force. Specifically, you stated that the police commission must fully commit to minimizing the use of force in incidents and you describe the use of force policy, which is as follows. The, the department's guiding value when using use of force shall be reverence for human life. That was what you stated. That was part of your goal and vision that you stated last November 2015. You also talked about building meaningful relationships between officers and community members as a means of to both lower the crime and reduce the use of force encounters. Again, that sounds really great and promising, um, and it's hard for us to dis disagree with that, but what w you describe, and this happens every week, what you describe and what we see and experience are like two completely different worlds. There's the PR version of Los Angeles where you present your police chief as the model leader for community or guardian policing as he describes himself, which is insulting and a joke, and then there's the reality. In the PR version, you say your guiding value is a reverence for human life. In the actual version, Norma Guzman gets shot and killed by officers who outnumber her and who are more heavily armed than her because she is holding a knife. Where was the reverence for her life? They say they feared for their safety and for the safety of their partners, but we don't believe them. You say that you are, guarded, that you are guided by a reverence for human life, but we don't believe you. You say you care about giving answers and building relationships with the community, but families have to come here every week. They have to take time out of their schedule every week and hound you for answers. So we don't believe you. When you signed up for this job, it was to provide strong, effective oversight. We don't see that oversight. Live up to your responsibilities and live up to the promises you made because the stakes are too high. The next three speakers, Terry Wilburn, Tut Hayes, Ebony Fay. Terry Wilburn, once again, my uh, concern is my oh my concern is excuse my voice <coughs> is that robbery and these pol police is gonna do a, do their robberies. My other concern by people paying them to do. If you walk down the street and the police in the black uh, night matter and the police tell you not to involve me, but they are involved and did the crime themselves <coughs> by them paying in Hollywood. My second thing is concerning that if a person give you information through whatever ways, you need to check on that information. And that information, like I speak with the Hollywood police. Hollywood police then investigate the area where that the, per the crime is taking place or the burglary is taking place. And in your forehead, there's a person who sells the items through auction. These people making zillions of money off of somebody else's property. Then the duplication of that property 
go to somebody else. This is why one of my officers in Hollywood got busted this morning by Black Lives Matter. I have officers who do certain jobs through my company, Fast Money, Dow Jones, uh, marketing. These females are out here being murdered, kidnapped, that bank book is taken, all the documentation, then reverse it over through the courts, all the way to the President of the United States. One thing I have to say, and I mean, expectation, that means that property don't belong to that person. It belongs to the original person that op operated that person, that property. Thank, thank you for your comments. Next, next Ted question. Hayes. I didn't look forward with great expectation, but it seemed to me reasonable and intelligent people such as you will be trying to do something about the fact that no information is ever collected from an arrestee about the next of kin. They simply don't ask that question. So it's pretty much difficult to inform the next of kin when a family member dies in custody. So I would imagine that would be one of the things you would be interested in getting information be interesting to getting and collecting so you could form, perform that operation. For instance, 152 says uh, perform an overt, overt act that conceals the body or directly impedes the ability of authorities or family members to discover the body. Now discovering a body doesn't mean collecting the body. It means where is she at? And someone in the police department says, call the coroner. The coroner can tell you where she's located. Well, the responsibility was of someone within that department to give that information. But the family member did the contacting. They're the ones who called. They're the ones who made the inquiry. That information was not put out directly, but the law seems to indicate that it should be put out directly to inform the family members where the body is. But you've never made an inquiry about that. You're not collecting that information. Now, I understand that the information on arrest is compiled by the Sheriff's Department and the county, but you can do some things on your own. This is a type one jail facility, and there are many things this department and your members can do on your own. Show that you're directing the, show that you're directing the policy by creating some policy on notifying collecting that and the next of kin. Do that. Next speaker, Ebony Fay, followed by Mariella Saba and Billy Davenport. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. I've taken your suggestion and saved my comments for the public uh, commenting period because you were right about that. I wanted to um, just um, say something really quickly um, to start that there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of feeling, there's a lot of emotion. People are on the defensive, um, and when we feel defensive, we can attack. Um, again, I wanna reiterate that nobody here thinks of themselves as a bad person, but there are some really, uh, there's some foul things that are happening. <sighs> and so I just wanted to speak to that. Um, but what I really am concerned most about is that this overall culture of how the police are trained, how what they are taught to think about, the citizens with whom they engage. Um, and just across the board, I can get that police are probably, you know, taught to protect themselves. They're trained to protect themselves, to be suspicious and, you know, in a good way. And I'm concerned about the overdrive of that. I'm concerned about that happening on steroids when people are conditioned that certain populations and certain people or certain areas are more crime prone, more violence prone than others. Um, I've been looking, I haven't really been able to find where um, adding police presence was the direct cause of a decrease in crime, what it seems to increase is the level of potentially violent and deadly encounters between police and citizens. And I think everybody just really wants to be safe. All things being equal, police officers know they may wind up losing their lives. 
And I don't fault people for trying to keep that from happening, but I think that there's this whole aspect that we expect each other to be violent, and so we keep doing these things, and I think that that needs to stop. And I'm not here to be Pollyannish, but I did just wanna like kind of speak that level of life into the room, and I just do wanna say, if we do seem, if aspects of this do seem vulgar and undignified, it's because at its heart, this is kind of a vulgar and undignified process. People are grieving and they're in pain. And they don't feel as if they're really being heard or really getting action on the things that they're saying, that their lives are not really being revered. Some people want to abolish police. I'm, I'm fin going to finish in 10 seconds. Some people want to abolish the police. I can completely understand that. But until that time, we are kind of in this little sauce together. And we do have to like find a way to get from here to wherever is going to be better. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, everybody, for our continued presence. We walk in here conscious that this is an epicenter of evil globally. And we still show up. Uh, right now, there's less police in the room. There's less arm armed people. But they're still present, and the constant threat of murder is there. It's in here, it's in the streets, it's everywhere we go as long as police are in our streets. So I, I think it is, and I know it is, our duty to chip and chip and chip away at this structure, especially here, and to keep engaging in our own power and each other's power and keep building that. This is one of the spaces where we've been doing that, and we could see that it's playing out. I got word of the disrespect that you received last week, Cynthia, in this space, and it's just telling of that evil that we were speaking about, that the Sobroff exudes racism because he represents and ha has the, that lineage and it's, and it's interconnected with it. And today we could see some of the moves that they're playing to see how they move you because you, p you are, are asking questions and that is not what this board was set up to do, to ask questions. This board was not meant to read reports. They're meant to stamp and stamp and stamp, as so many of our community members have named. Um, and you're, you're, you're pushing in there, and you do your part. We're, we all get to do our part. But we know what the, the issue is, the whole setup here. So um, I hope everybody can stay grounded today. And the reason we come here so much is because our people are murdered. So if we can use the last seconds in this platform to hold space, um, silence in our own power. If you want to name folks, let's name them here, and we're going to just keep drawing in all that, that strength from all the spirits who, who are seeking justice through our lives and through our bodies. So let's hold some silence. Presente. Present. 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 Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Present. Next speaker, Billy Davenport, followed Norma by Dr. Guzman. Tiffany willoughby Herard. I know um, all of this electricity and things that are running here and you guys time, I know all of that costs money. And um, although uh, we don't have the things that we want in order, I did want to take the time to uh, thank whoever is responsible for this type of forum where we do get to speak and say what we need to say. <coughs> These people that are here uh, as loud and as whatever they are, they're here because they care about the community. And we're, we're all here for that reason. I think if the department chose to get along with the community instead of making us all suspects, then you guys would probably not have such a problem solving crimes. It would probably be some people that would be willing to help and be a part of your get down, but you guys are not a part of ours. As far as I can see, this department has broken every quotation you guys have around this wall. When I was young, when I was young, the officers that police my community, they came with Dodger baseball cards and little bubble gum and stuff like that to make the kids in the community respect them. I work and I contribute to what I believe to be the police uh, for us through my taxes that I pay and things of that nature, but I can't even say good morning to a police officer. 
I can't even say good afternoon to that man. I can't even walk up to a police officer and shake his hand in, in the community. The police officers look at us as though we are not even a part of the community. We are not being served or protected. We're just being watched and surveyed. And that's what should be up there. So thank you very much for the time. Um, I also noticed words like reverence and commitment and integrity and respect and service. And I'm really disappointed because what I've heard is a record of negligence of commissioners not actually following through on the work of holding these inspector generals and these officers accountable. I see dereliction of duty and I see people who are not able to distinguish between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. I'm a scholar and I approach things from the basis of evidence. We expect you to do the job. You are mandated to represent the voice of this community, not to be a rubber stamp, and you are not doing it. It is the actual processes of having reports filed that don't actually interrogate any real issues it's the process that's the punishment. It's the process that is taking our hearts out of us. It is the process that you all are involved in that is the problem. So what I'm here to ask you all to do is to think about what integrity might mean, to think about what service and respect for people might mean. I'm asking you all, whatever it is that you believe in, to go home and get on your prayer closet floor and to go to whoever it is that you worship and believe in and ask that higher power to humble you so that you can have in your heart some compassion for the people who have been coming here for years now. When that man left, I said shame to him because it's clear by his actions that he has lost touch with any kind of morality or ethics. The next three speakers, Jamie Garcia. Jamie Garcia, Patty Beers, and Hamid Khan. I got here a little late, so I wasn't able to comment on the body-worn video um, report with the digital in-car video system. So I just want to, and I'm sure this commission is familiar with <coughs> the fact that we knew, found out in 2014 that 90 of the 300 digital in-car video systems antennas were actually broken off or taken off in the southwest, um, southeast division, and there was no investigation done at all. So, um, and I appreciate this question of what will happen when the body-worn video cameras, when there's a violation that's found. So I um, didn't hear what um, he actually stated. He listed rambling really quickly what the disciplinary action would be. But I went outside. So apparently, officers who um, are found in violation will um, get either more training, will get a comment card, or a notice to correct. So they get a series of notes, depending on what their commanding officer thinks that um, or believes that they need, right? So we get a series of little paper notes. Um, then a complaint can be filed to internal affairs. They again investigate, determine if this violation has, has occurred. Then it goes back to the commanding officer and he recommends discipline, which ultimately falls into the hands of the chief of police, who's not present. So, <coughs> so we see this process, and again, this process um, I don't trust because I already see when 90 of 300 video, um, digital in-car video systems are tampered with, that this commission feels that it's not unnecessary to do an investigation. So we're starting from that baseline already. So if 90 of, so, so what's gonna happen when we see this big violation again with body-worn video cameras? Because we're expecting to see this violation. Um, <coughs> and then the other thing is, is like I was wondering, how do they find out if a violation actually occurred? So in this report, there was no audit of the daily audit that's supposed to occur um, with, these vi uh, with these videos from the body-worn cameras. <coughs> so we don't even know if they're being audited on a daily basis. Uh, so we don't even know how many violations have occurred and then how many actually were not followed up on. 
So, and then again, the discipline falls back onto the chief of police. And as we saw the police union and their pressure on you guys, we know again that, you know, this is a very weak reform and that nothing's really going to come from it. So I would suggest, again, like the sister was just explaining, that there needs to be more demands from this commission for more invigorous um, investigations. Because again, we don't trust that these body-worn video cameras are actually going to do anything. And Sandra Figueroa, that means you as well. You need to speak. Thank you for your comments. People need to speak on this Thank commission. Thank you for your comments. Your time is up. Patty Beers. I don't usually speak here, but right now I'm terrified. I'm still shaking because what happened right there. When a man who appears to be all roided up, is afraid of an unarmed black man. That's terrifying. How many cops have said I was afraid when it was an unarmed person, especially a black man? And then to see that a foot from my face and he's like, oh, I'm scared. Protect me. Bullshit. We all know that man has a gun, maybe two guns. Why is he afraid of an unarmed black man who's smaller than him? I've been coming here to this meeting, documenting for over two years now. I remember before Black Lives Matter started coming here, things were different. There were no coward fences out front. It wasn't hard to get in here. That's another racist thing that we see constantly. Michael Moore three weeks ago, it's an ironic name by the way, talked about rules of engagement. That was ironic also, because the rules of engagement have to do with battlefields, they have to do with when you fire your gun. And you don't fire your gun until someone's fired on you first. Ah. Ahmed Khan. all the reports and everything else that we see, you can't hide the truth. <coughs> this is the whole apparatus. So I want to bring it back to you, Matt, that uh, uh, when I was making that presentation two weeks ago, <coughs> we were going to schedule a longer presentation. I sent an email to Mr. Tfank and I never heard back. Uh, so the question is, when are we going to follow up on that next step? <coughs> when we had talked about scheduling a presentation. I'll send you a letter in the next week or so. Okay, looking forward to the letter. So now, <laughs> the thing here is that we've, got, we've gone through this whole process and what this is is like a three-legged stool. I mean, we know that LAPD is completely discredited because fundamentally policing is flawed by design. It murders, it conspires, it plants false evidence, and it completely lies all the time. Of course, we started this campaign, LAPC fails to show whether they can provide any iota of oversight. That is happening to be a failure as well. The third leg of the stool, the Inspector General's office, and you've seen the audits, what they have done, which basically are not just audits. They are just basic reports, a pass-through. But what is happening is that this structure, this massive structure that is founded on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency continues to kill us. The media has failed. They don't want to talk about it. They don't, because there's a lot of money involved. The, 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 the politicians have failed. They've completely submitted, because political careers are made to look tough on terror. This is what is going on. So what you will continue to see is a pass-through, a sign-on, and a rubber stamp. But we cannot stop coming here. We cannot, cannot stop coming here. They don't have the power. We have the power. Right. They don't have the courage. We have the courage. Right. 
They don't have the gumption, we have the gumption. They don't have the resilience, we have the resilience. This is what we need to do. We need to be back here every time. They have a cadre of lawyers, they have a cadre of guns, they have a cadre of helicopters. What we have is our country. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Khan. And we will win. Thank you. There are no other cards on this item. We're now on item number five. We have three common cards. We have Ted Hayes, Billy Davenport, and Prentice Jenkins. And this is relative to closed session items. This item uh, has two officers and a dog shooting. <laughs> now all I can do is speculate whether or not these officers were being threatened by the dog, impeded by the dog, a guard dog, something like that. But that you will find out whether the two officers fired shots into the dog. Now uh, our regulations require any dog that bites a human being be euthanized. These officers seem to exterminate the dog if two of them fired at the dog at the same time. But I'd like to know what the circumstances were. I'll never know. But it seemed to me that two officers killed the dog by gunfire, I would suspect. Um, perhaps they used mace on the dog, even a baton on the dog. I have no idea. But the speculation always leads to the most severe activity against this dog, and that's gunfire. So I would like to find out why it took two officers to put down one dog. <laughs> Billy Davenport <laughs> and Prentice Jenkins, please. Prentice Jenkins, City Life newsletter, publisher, activist since 1991. Uh, the officer involved shooting of uh, Mr. Bird. I once made a comment that eventually all cops are going to be in officer involved shootings. But being inspired today by uh, Commissioner Soboroff's contrite apology, I figured it's my turn to comp uh, also apologize to all the officers who, I, officers who I said that to, to the board. And to anyone else I offended, uh, thank you, Commissioner Soboroff. That was a very honorable thing to do, and uh, only a big man would do that. Thank you. And we have no other common cards. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss item number 5A1 and 2 in accordance with Government Code 54957.
The Board of Police Commissioners has concluded its work in closed session. We are back in open session and closed session. Item number 5A1 was discussed and the rationale was unanimously adopted. In closed session, item number 5A2 was discussed and the Chief's recommendations were unanimously adopted. Mr. President, is there a motion to adjourn? We have a motion to adjourn. So I'm Jen Mahoney in Studio City. You're watching LA City View Channel 35, where you can get the best in culture and arts. It's our city, it's our channel. Hey, just go! I'm standing here in San Pedro at the Red Car Railroad Station. This is a